Yeah, you're presented six rockets and 4,000 rounds of payload. Uh, Let's not talk about how low we are. Two, three, four, the Bell Z is very tight. I can't risk this quickly. Crossing line, hey, crossing this fucking line. Movement. Two, you're in. Next bird is in. That was... Key to the fan just collided. Greetings, this is The Sexy, and welcome to another episode of Hindsight. Today we'll be looking at two incidents during the extract phase of a mission from 2020. The first is a ground one, while the second is in the air, and both offer interesting complications to consider when dealing with contested extractions. We're starting at the point where friendly forces had attacked and secured the final objective town after having fought for about two hours to get there. First platoon, consisting of Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, was relatively intact, though Bravo was under strength. Second platoon, Echo and Delta, was under strength, with Delta and Echo each having seven members. There were four Hueys acting as transport and resupply, call signs Phantom 1 through 4, and I was flying an OH-6 with a single minigun, call sign Phantom 6, with Crane Song as my co-pilot. There was also an AH-6, call sign Reaper, which was piloted by Bismarck and co-piloted by Ninja Socks. The infantry squads were spread out along the northern arc of the town, with most either in the town or right on the edge. Echo was the exception, having taken position in a copse of trees about 100 meters north of the town's edge. The sun had set, and darkness wasn't far away. Dallas, the platoon commander, gave the extract order. The plan was to conduct an extraction from within the town. All squads will be conducting uh, LZ at the health headquarters. Extract will be as good. follows. Bravo, Charlie, Alpha, Delta, Echo will be last. The light level had been dropping steadily and it was becoming a significant influence on air. Exactly, but we are very quickly losing contact capability. It had become challenging to identify and engage vehicles approaching the town once they'd gone dark. And the more time passed, the worse it became. Man, uh, so we're getting a lot of pressure from the I northwest along the road. Right? We, uh, we're having a hard time seeing them. This dying light caused a shift in plans with the PZ moving to an area to the southeast of town. Marked as PZ Fox Die. Hey, this is Platoon. What, what's the issue? We, we can't see the LZ basically, so we, we won't be able to land with these obstructions, so you need to land at PZ Fox Die. Oh, my vehicle's coming from. Yeah, we don't have that vision. Yeah. Understood. So, PZ Fox Die will be much easier for you, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Dallas had the platoon begin to withdraw, and as this was happening, Phantom 6 came under acoustic attack from a yapper dog. Startling my co-pilot, but leaving me unaffected. Begin a slow withdrawal towards Fox Die. Alpha, hold position. Dude, Charlie, Bravo, fall back to the scared. west side of Fox Die. Close to the northeast side. ROE prohibited a response, so I continued on. Below, a ZU-23 truck rolled into town and became a temporary issue for air. As squads began to reposition for the new PZ, Echo took a rocket and became a mass casualty situation. Echo's mass cas, we just got rocketed. Roger. With Echo unable to move on its own, Dallas told Charlie, which was led by Kevbo, to move to them to assist their treatment and withdrawal. Charlie, I need you to move north. I know I just told you. Support Echo and make sure you can get them out of there. Uh, Charlie copies rest me, Echo. Echo. Echo has immediate close contact on top of us. Roger. We're attempting Echo, uh, to move south. Roger. Charlie is moving Charlie's towards uh, you. Well, two medic is on the way with Charlie as well. Command, Charlie, keep those flares going. I can see very little. That's a negative, Charlie. We've got to save them for the extract. Uh, Charlie's going to be coming and effective on top of enemy investigation. You were out of you. Fortunately, we were now receiving mortar illumination missions, keeping Charlie and Echo from being totally in the dark. The darkness continued to deepen. In the air, Reaper and I turned on our floodlights to give some additional visibility. I'm going to have my flood on. Oh, likewise. While we had running lights, they were infrared and would be useless in this yeah. scenario. One of the Phantoms was brought in to drop additional resupply, including more flares, which Alpha helped to recover. Be advised, Phantom 3 is going to try another pair drop of a fire team crate by Alpha. They'll be in the airspace momentarily. I extended my orbit, wanting to give Reaper more room to maneuver to potentially support the Echo Charlie situation, relying on Crane to watch the scene through the sensor pod. Mass casualties on Charlie Echo's position. They're currently getting overrun from the north, it looks like. Back, be advised. Man, Everything man. that is not under a flare yeah. is black hole now. I've got more than 10 guys dead or down on the deck here by uh, Charlie Echo. 
Yeah, we're big over on the option. And with that, Dallas had to pull back. Platoons withdrawing. We make this Charlie and Echo are overrun. Platoon was withdrawing. It's Fox side of the LZ you're looking at. Roger, you are bypassed by enemy HQ. You are running collision into contact. Contact. Above, I headed in to see if I could help with Crane assessing the ground situation. Checking next, are those bad guys? There's the full enemy squad on top of Charlie Outside Echo top. bodies. Is Reaper cleared hot on the Charlie Echo position? Uh, there are a lot of. Mixed. Charlie and Echo are overrun. I made a few passes, firing at some enemy I could see, with Reaper alternating runs with me. The situation down there looked grim. It seemed like Echo and Charlie were completely gone. Oh, that's fucking nasty. It had only been minutes, but there was nothing moving in their area, aside from the enemy. I don't think we're going to be able to get Charlie to uh, go out of there. You fucking nose dove after I asked. <laughs> I was really worried. I was like, that's the last thing that Grand should Delta's slowly uh, getting pushed. Uh, Raj, oh, Alpha, Delta, slow withdrawal back towards the LZ. We are unable to get Echo and Charlie out of there. There's way too many infantry over there. Upper up. Fuck, I'm hit. Main rider slightly hit. Platoon's withdrawing to LZ. Holy shit. Charlie Echo's bitch is totally overrun. This fucking light went out, it's just a black hole. Yeah. Bravo, Phantom 1. No, we're not gonna be able to do jack shit here. Meanwhile, Bravo had been hit hard. Just getting word that uh, Bravo was destroyed. Uh, it's gonna be south. Where is Bravo? Alright, so uh, we're gonna have to, to the conduct the extracts south. out of headquarters. We will not well, be able uh, to go to Fox 9. So, like, we do not have the numbers yeah, to secure the LZ, okay. so... The Back, let's make sure air is ready to do this. All we'll units fall back into that headquarters. Go defensive right inside passed. the walls. With Reaper focused on the northern part of town, I headed south to check on Bravo's area. I could see enemy on a nearby hill, with indications that friendlies were somewhere in the vicinity. The first Phantom headed in for extract. Delta back up, we're inside the HQ. We have no Smoke one on the LZ, south please. of that wall. Like, southwest okay. of that wall. They just set the commands broken down. But we have no marks anywhere close. As Freddy and Phantom 1 approached, I was doing gun runs on the enemy near the seeming Bravo survivor's position. He flew over my targets shortly after one run, then was loading troops while I was reattacking. Reaper was running low on rockets, working on targets roughly north of where I was. Reaper's down to 6 rockets and 4,000 rounds of uh, minigun. Let's not talk about how low we are. I ran in again, trying to both keep enemy from approaching from the south, and also trying to protect what seemed to be at least one Bravo survivor. Crane had noticed something unusual on the ground, which turned out to be a resupply crate with a chem light near it. Oh, that's weird. What? Is there a new thing where... Two, three, four, the Delta the is very high? tight. Delta's it. What do you mean? Phantom 1 called that they were heading out south. One outbound south. As I recovered from a run, I had a split second in which I could see a Huey crossing into my path. I pulled up, but there simply wasn't enough time. I impacted into and bounced off the rotors, then crashed nearby, and the Huey went down as well. To say I was surprised to have run into a transport helo that high up was a bit of an understatement. How'd that happen? There are two elements of this that I'll be covering. The first is just a broad look at what happened on the ground. I have footage from other players, but since this happened in October of last year, I'm unable to do contemporaneous interviews to establish more of the cause and effect. So this will be mostly broader observations on what happened, based on the video and the AAR. The biggest influence on the extract attempt was the lighting situation and lack of illumination capabilities. With helos having no night vision and ground elements being limited for flares, two things happened. One was that the airspace became more dangerous because of the lighting issues, and the other was that the landing zone selection became more important. Freddy and Phantom 1 made a call to use a different PZ than the one that Dallas had originally wanted, which was a reasonable precaution to take given the unpredictable flare availability. The PZ that Dallas then chose, PZ Fox Die, was a reasonable choice that had nothing inherently wrong with it. It was open terrain, sufficient to do a multi-helo lift, and wasn't that far from any given squad. The wrench that ended up being thrown into the plan happened when Echo became a mass casualty. Charlie had been providing some cover to them from their south, but had begun moving right as Echo was hit by heavy fire. By the time Echo communicated this up, Charlie had to turn around and come at them from a slightly different direction to try to rescue them. Harrier, the Echo medic, was in a good position to observe what happened. Daishi, leading Echo, had given an early order for people to move, 
but with many of the Echo members legged, they couldn't easily withdraw. Gotcha. I'm going gotcha. to make the call that once we're stable, we're moving back into town. Attempting to give epinephrine for emergency movement was only partially effective. Carrier, can you hit us with epi so we can get moving south? Yeah, who's legged? Keep moving. Keep moving south. I can carry some. While dealing with the wounded and trying to withdraw, Echo had shifted to where they were no longer able to look over the small rise that they had previously occupied to the northeast. A squad was able to walk up on them and engage at close range as a result. Echo has immediate close contact on top of us. We are attempting to move south. Shortly after this, Charlie arrived. Dice, you were here. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Roger, there's Tell contact west-northwest. Could use assistance over here. Okay, the issue they ran into was that while they knew contacts had been coming from the north, the Echo leader, Daishi, suggested they not move further north after what his team had experienced. Really do, really do not recommend you go any further north here. Yep. Hey, do not push any further north, guys. Pull back south, Charlie. Due to this, Charlie didn't occupy the northeastern rise and was thus unable to detect the two enemy fire teams moving unseen at them from that direction. Instead, Charlie focused on fighting contacts approaching from the area that they could observe out to the west. Right as the first of the northeastern fire teams crested, Charlie took an RPG from close range to the northwest, hitting Leakster directly and killing or wounding almost everyone still alive. Yep. Uh, holy fuck. Immediately after the blast, half of Echo and Charlie was either dead or unconscious. The enemy were then able to rush close and begin overrunning the Charlie and Echo position, and not long after this, both squads were completely wiped out. While Reaper had been supporting them previously, by the time I made my first gun run to try to support them, it was already far too late for it to matter. The first lesson learned here is that rescuing a squad doesn't necessarily mean running up directly onto their position. Keeping your team separated from each other and maneuvering to relieve pressure on the beleaguered squad could help to buy time for medics to do their thing and the flow of enemies to be stemmed. Had Charlie split into two elements that moved to the flanks of Echo while the medics worked on the wounded, or had one element hold back to provide overwatch, there's a fair chance that at least some people would have made it out alive. The other lesson is that when you're moving into an area, it behooves you to assess the immediate terrain in order to determine where the greatest risks are. While this will often be fairly obvious, it's also possible to end up in a situation like this where a small rise is enough to completely block a large angle of approach. Being able to notice more subtle aspects of terrain like this is a great skill to develop. It's also worth noting that the element you're relieving will be able to tell you about the dangers in the area, but you should also make your own assessment as to what needs to be done to salvage the situation. You may see something that the other leader has missed, or vice versa. Down south, Bravo had moved to and set up near PZ Foxdai. They split into two elements, one three-person group covering from near a fortification northwest of the PZ, and the other six members closer to the PZ. The larger element took an RPG that killed three players, including the squad lead, and shortly after that, the medic, Zabby Babby, was killed trying to deploy smoke and assess the casualties. The two remaining members of that element, Diet Crack and Roster Roster, withdrew. Across from them, the other element had taken two KIA, leaving Tagwin as a sole survivor. Above, I had arrived in time to see that a fight was still seemingly happening in Bravo's area, and was about to start supporting Tagwin's position. Now as to the mid-air specifically, what happened there? While many things factored in, the most actionable factor was the profile used when flying out. We'll cover the other aspects in a moment, but first, let's look at how Freddy took off and left the PZ. The flight profile used here had Freddy at almost 60 meters of altitude, less than 200 meters from the PZ itself. This is a fairly steep profile, and when operating with cast doing danger close, it's a risky maneuver. Now as to why that's risky, let's briefly discuss how transports and cast aircraft work in this sort of scenario. A fundamental premise of flying in Shaktac is that CAS aircraft has the right of way. Attack pilots are doing a task that requires a great deal of focus and precision, particularly in danger close, and they tend to zip in and out of the airspace in unpredictable, ever-changing ways based on what's shooting at them, as well as what they need to shoot. This constant maneuvering means that the reference frame for an attack pilot is always shifting, and ground fire or ground threats are reacted to continually. It's a very fluid process. Attack pilots can keep track of other attack pilots operating in the same area, but there's not always the bandwidth to keep track of transports as well. Now, much of the time, this is possible, but the more demanding the role, the less time CAS will be able to spend worrying about tracking transports. Things like dire ground situations, high CAS tempo, significant ground threats, and weather, lighting, or comm issues 
can all add up to a workload that keeps the cast crews constantly busy. On the other hand, transport pilots operate in a significantly different fashion. They're out of danger while waiting for a call, and once that call is made, they're able to take time to plan their route in, observe the terrain, check the map, and orient on everything noteworthy in the AO. A landing, whether it's an insert or extract, is something generally planned to the extent that they know where the landing zone is, what direction they'll enter it from, and how they'll leave the area. They can watch for attack aircraft as they head towards the landing zone, picking up context clues like tracers and rockets being fired from CAS, ground fire, and similar. After landing, they're able to continue assessing the scenario to determine if their exfil plan is still valid or what adjustments might need to be made. In this case, the ingress happened while I was making gun runs on a target in the flight path of Phantom 1 to the LZ. After landing, another gun run could be seen happening in the area in which Freddy was planning to fly through. From his perspective, assuming he saw these events, the response could have been two things. The first would be to plan an exfil profile that would stay as low as possible to avoid getting in the way, which is passive deconfliction and should always be in effect in any kind of hot LZ scenario where Cass is on station. The other would be to check the map to determine where the attack helos were and communicate directly with them in a positive confirmation way prior to liftoff. This is active deconfliction. You know that you're about to be a potential obstacle for CAS to consider, and since they're likely focused on other things, you should get confirmation about your planned route. This is one of those things a co-pilot in a lead aircraft can be particularly helpful for. There are some pretty interesting visibility aspects to how this played out. Looking at this from my perspective, note how as I zoom back out here, the Huey was already above the lit area and blending into the darkness of the surroundings. Since we were on a perfect collision intercept course, there was no relative movement from the Huey on my windscreen, and it was only at the last moment that I even saw it. My emergency climb attempt was sufficient to give a positive rate of climb, but since Freddy had been climbing at full power the whole time, he still intercepted my path. It's kind of amazing to look at this and realize that if I had simply not climbed at all, the collision would have likely been avoided. However, since I was above the other helo, our climb response on my end had the most chance of success, but failed here due to other factors. In this sort of situation, climbing or diving are the actions with the fastest response. They work on the lift vector immediately, whereas rolling and pulling requires you to spend some more time rolling before the pull is able to significantly alter course. Rolling can also change the geometry of the approach. For instance, the Huey rolling here actually gives a broader target and makes a collision more likely than otherwise. That's not what happened here, but it's not far away from being what happened here. Which, honestly, would have been pretty cool. In a tragic way. I guess that's really the theme of hindsight, isn't it? Hindsight. Kinda cool, in a tragic way. One human factor we discovered after the fact in discussing this was that Freddy can get motion sickness from time to time in scenarios with darkness, flickering lights, and motion. And to help with that, when it feels like it's about to happen, he'll toggle track IR off temporarily. You can see at the start of his clip that he did this right before takeoff, which caused his perspective to be aligned with the nose, making it difficult for him to see ahead as clearly as otherwise. Two, you're in. Oh my god! Here we have a side-by-side -side showing what it looked like for him on the left, and what it looks like with a typical takeoff with head tracking on the right. The difference in this case was roughly two seconds in which the OH-6 could have been seen. Note too that human vision picks up changes best when continually observing a scene, and having some kind of interruption, such as not seeing the sky for a short period of time, makes it harder to notice a change, such as the OH-6 coming into view. This is known as changed blindness, and is a pretty interesting thing to read about. Also note that while the OH-6 had the landing light on and it was clearly visible from Freddy's perspective to us as we rewatch it, the fact that it could be seen didn't mean that it would be seen. In his case, he was focused on the lower right portion of his screen, putting the OH-6 in peripheral vision. This is just one of those things that happens as you can't be fully focused on every part of your screen simultaneously. The biggest change here would simply come from having head tracking enabled, allowing for easy scanning of the airspace being flown into. Given that the options were head tracking enabled and potentially, you know, having a biological incident or turning it off and being okay, it's completely understandable that it was done here. But it was also a factor, so it's worth pointing out. In this playback, you can see two Hueys. The higher one is a path actually flown, while the lower one demonstrates a safer egress profile. As noted earlier, the flight profile Freddy used when leaving the PZ had him too high, too soon putting him into the area that Cass was operating. The best thing to do when Cass is conducting danger close near a PZ is to stay as low as you safely can, 
In this case, there was concern about a flare going out at the wrong moment, but the area that was being flown into was such that even had this happened, the relatively bright horizon would have given enough visibility on nearby trees to avoid a collision. In addition to that, the landing light of the Huey points well forward to the aircraft, making it possible to fly close to the ground and maintain good speed without worrying about hitting something. By staying low, you achieve two things. One, you make yourself an overall more difficult target for the enemy when trees and buildings are around, as high speed and low altitude results in being masked more easily by trees and buildings. The other is that you're generally out of the area in which cast aircraft would be flying, and due to being closer to the ground, they're more likely to see you due to your rotor wash. Staying near or below treetop level gives you the added bonus that most attack runs by cast will recover from their dives before reaching that level, making a collision with them that much less likely. The other aspect of risk management involved the interplay between Reaper in their AH-6 and Phantom-6 in our OH-6 alike. The majority of the missions saw us operating independently, with Reaper handling CAS and us dealing primarily with scouting. When we shifted over to the final objective, Reaper had the town and anything approaching it, while I kept a wider orbit and spotted or engaged vehicles as able. Once it was dark, I started doing a few different things to maintain my situational awareness and try to risk manage. One was staying away from Reaper's area whenever possible, and if I did enter into it, to get a fix on them before starting in. Attack runs were done such that I tried to fire tracers early enough to show Reaper where I was and where I was going, and when I finished the run, I climbed into the bright sky in order to more clearly see what was in my path. In this example, I completely looped back in order to ensure that I wasn't in Reaper's way as they exited their attack. When flying around otherwise, I stayed higher and used the bright sky and horizon to maintain awareness on anything co-altitude or higher. The Hueys with their bright anti-collision lights were very easy to see in the distance. As long as I didn't descend, I was always able to tell who, if anyone, was around me at my level. Glancing more frequently at the GPS made it possible to catch the Reaper Blue Force tracker icon if they were close enough, giving another simple cue to reference. There were a few other types of risk management throughout, to include my co-pilot, Crane, checking to make sure I was aware of something. Do you see Reaper? They're coming in from right east. Okay, they bypassed us. Go for fact and me calling out my barometric altitude when a phantom came into the area to do a supply drop. Charlie, how you doing? 4 two, watch for 6. 6 is holding 4.30 barrel. Overall, while the scenario was challenging from the perspective of having two cast aircraft operating the same area in poor lighting conditions, the techniques both crews used to maintain awareness of each other meant that the risk was largely mitigated. This scenario ended up being a great example of how quickly things can take a turn for the worse. Charlie and Echo's troubles were immediately followed by Bravo getting nearly wiped out. And to top that off, a mid-air soon followed, wiping out everyone on that first helo, as well as our scout helo. It was quite the sequence of events, and it was a lot of fun to dig into to figure out how and why everything ended up the way it did. To wrap this up, let's have a toast to Diet Crack and Ross Rosser, the Bravo survivors who, upon mounting their extract query, surely must have been glad to have that defensive nightmare behind them. I'd like to imagine that one of them said something like, Boy, I'm glad that's over with, or, wow, that was close, right as they were lifting off. At least that's how I'll remember it. If you enjoyed this, there are a few things you can do that would help ensure more are made. There's the basic aspects of subscribing, enabling notifications, ringing the bell, and all that stuff. But there's also my Patreon campaign, which directly supports the effort required to produce videos like Hindsight, Art of Flight, the VTTP series, and my year in review videos. Patreon is what makes these possible to continue with. Aside from that, the best assistance comes from spreading the word and sharing this with anyone you think would enjoy it. Finally, if you have thoughts on what happened here, or aspects that you particularly enjoyed or want to see more of, let me know in the comments. Thanks as always for the support, and until next time, take care.